Now we're going to proceed to the book of Acts, Acts 15. And Acts 15 is possibly the most uh, important chapter in the book of Acts. you got to put it there with Acts 2, Acts 7, when Israel was finally uh, rejected Jesus Christ officially as a nation. God continued to deal with them as, as individuals, as Jews. Acts 9, when Paul's converted. Acts 10, when the Peter goes to Cornelius, and then Acts 15. Acts 13, we just did, and 14 are very important too because you're finally starting to see the gospel of grace being preached by Paul. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. It's a different gospel. So we're not talking about the Lord's return for salvation, but you can have it when you trust Him and believe on Him. Now, starting in chapter 15, said, And certain men which came down from Judea talked the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised, after the manner of Moses ye cannot be saved. Now, these he's, they're talking about these Gentile believers that they were just uh, talking about here in the church of Antioch. And these were Jewish believers that were saying that these Gentile believers needed to be circumcised, or they cannot be saved. Remember, these Jewish believers were still waiting for the Lord's return in order for them to be saved. They didn't even understand the doctrines. They didn't understand the gospel that they had been converted under. They didn't worry about that because they didn't understand it. But they were worried about them being circumcised. Now, see, to be a proselyte of Israel, you had, of course, the Gentiles, the men, the males, were circumcised. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they had a pretty good argument, I guess, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now, um, being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. Now, some of these are Jewish believers here, but they had great joy that the Gentiles were starting to uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether they understood the gospel that was being presented to them or not, I don't know. But they were just, they were happy about the Jews, that some of the Gentiles were believing. And when they were coming to Jerusalem, they were received of the church. Now we know there's a, a church that's a part of all the believers that were, at this time, that were believers. They were in a church that's a spiritual body of believers. But they were, they were the local churches. And there was one, the main ones at Jerusalem. And that's where they went. And, uh, and it says they, at Jerusalem they had received of the church and of the apostles and elders and they declare all things which God had done with them. And they tell them about the things that happened in uh, chapters 13 and 14. About the conversions of, of those being saved and all they'd been dealing with. I don't know if they told him how he'd, Paul had been stoned or to death or not, but they just gave him a, a, a story about all these things that had taken place. So then there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. See, there were Pharisees that believed. What had they believed? Well, they believed the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They were still law. Uh, they had kept the law. They were circumcised Jews. And what were they saying? that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. They weren't concerned about the uh, Jews that had believed Paul's ministry. They were only concerned about the Gentiles because those Jews that believed, naturally they were law, they kept the law, they were circumcised. So they, that is what they considered to be the qualifications. But they commanded them to keep the law of Moses and, and to be circumcised in order to be needful for them to do that said and the apostles and the elders came together to consider the matter in verse 7 when they were had been much disputing Peter rose up and said unto them men and brethren you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe now Peter's referencing back to Acts chapter 10 when he ministered to Cornelius his family and his friends his, his close associates um uh, Remember I told you that it was important that uh, Acts 10 had a lot to do with Acts 15 because that's what Peter's talking about. And he's, he's, he's reflecting back when those Gentiles believed that he ministered to. He gave them 
He gave them the words of faith. He gave them the. He told them that their salvation was through Jesus Christ, and they believed. Remember, they got the Holy Ghost when they believed. They didn't have to be water baptized. They had to have hands laid on them. They hadn't been circumcised. None of that stuff. Uh, they they weren't under the law. They weren't law keeping Gentiles. And verse eight, and God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as He did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. They had no qualifications. Their only qualification was they believed, and they got the Holy Ghost. The reason that Peter knew that, and those ones that traveled with him, was because they spoke in tongues. It was a sign that they had received the Holy Ghost. That's why it was given to him as a sign. Now look what he says in, in verse 10. This is an interesting verse. He says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? He's referring here to the Gentile believers. Which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Those Jews, never, remember we, some of these references that I gave you back in the Old Testament? Those Jews, they didn't keep the law. They broke it all the time. That's why they had that sacrificial uh, system in the temple. When they would fail, when they would sin, and that, that animal sac blood sacrifice was made for the forgiveness of their sins. Uh, they weren't able, it says, nor we were able to bear it. He's talking about those Jews that were converted under the gospel of the kingdom, those that would believed on Jesus Christ as the Christ, the Son of God. Well, they, they, they broke the law. Uh, the interesting thing about this is, remember, when Jesus Christ was crucified, the veil of the temple was torn top to bottom. So that was the end of the sacrifices for forgiveness of sins with the, through the temple sacrifice. And these believers in Jesus Christ, that was the problem that Paul had when Stephen preached, referring back to Isaiah 66. God's no longer honoring those sacrifices. So how were these believers under the gospel of the kingdom forgiven when they when they failed to keep the law and they would mess up you have to remember when you go for doctrine for these people in the early book of Acts under the gospel of the kingdom you got to go to the book of James the book of 1 Peter and the book of 1 John for their doctrine then 1 John it says if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and it says that Jesus Christ is an advocate he's their advocate and you also learn in Hebrews which hadn't I don't think had been released yet Paul had probably written part of it or all of it but not except the ending and I don't think it's released till the second Timothy is released at the end of his ministry but it's for the Jews in the future and it even goes further and explains the fact that Jesus Christ is a uh, uh, high priest uh, after the order of Melchizedek who can bring forgiveness to these people when they fail under the gospel of the kingdom. In other words, to maintain their salvation. And it gets into, I could go back to uh, where Jesus is washing the feet of the apostles, you remember, and, and Peter says, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said, well, if, you, uh, if, if you won't let me wash your feet, you'll have no part of me. And he goes on and explains, he says, you're all clean, but you're clean, but not all. And he's talking about Judas. Well, that foot washing, he said, you'll understand this later. That foot washing has to do with them maintaining their salvation. And when they fail, they confess their sins to him. And he cleanses. It's their feet as they walk through the earth. They're forgiven, but not all, as they go through the work. And they fail sometimes. So that's what this is a picture of, this foot washing back there. And... Uh, Jesus is the advocate, and that's how they maintain their salvation under the gospel of the kingdom. He says, we weren't able to keep it. Our fathers weren't able to keep it. Well, that's how they maintain their salvation. But look at verse, this is the most important verse, probably of one single verse, with the exception maybe when Paul says, Lord, what wilt thou have me do when he met him on the road to Damascus? But as far as doctrine goes, this is the most important verse in, in the uh, book of Acts. It says that we believe, now who's the we? He's talking about all the apostles that got together. He's talking about Barnabas and, and Paul and all of them got together and put their heads together, come to agreement. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Now, this is something that Peter had never mentioned. 
this is something new, and this is something he a conclusion he had come to, is the fact that they were saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the we here are the Jews. We Jews shall be saved even even as they, the Gentiles. That word even. Four letter word. Those four letter, letter words in the uh, in your King James Bible sometimes are the uh, most, uh, they'll give you more life in that than anything else as you read through the King James Bible. I'm going to read you a, a definition of the word even in the uh, 1828 dictionary of the American Dictionary of the English Language. It says, even, an adverb, used here as an adverb, noting the level of, or equality or emphatically a like manner or degree. Like manner or degree. And he gives an example. As it has been done to you, even so shall it be done to others. It means the same way. Uh, it's used in Philippians 2 a. But it says here, And being found in fashion as a man, speaking of Jesus Christ, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. See how that word even is used. Obedient unto death, even the death. It, it, it explains it. That's what the word even here does. Now how much did they know about salvation when this is, when, when Peter mentions this? They didn't have all the revelation. Peter was only knew what Paul knew, and that they, that the Gentiles were starting to be saved by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ, and saved at the instant they believed. Peter reflects back on Cornelius and what happened to them. He puts it together. The same thing happened to Cornelius. Received the Holy Ghost when they believed. They didn't have to do water baptism before they got the Holy Ghost. In Acts 13 and 14, Paul never mentions water baptism. Not one time. It's all about believing. Now, verse 11 is a verse that only Peter could do. If we go back, I want to show you something back here. Matthew 16, 19. This is Peter's confession. I'm going to read it. Jesus asked him who the people say that they end, that he is. <clears throat> and he says, uh, verse 16, it's inside with Peter answered. He said, in verse 15, he said, he saith unto them, Jesus said unto them, the apostles, but whom say ye that I am? Ye, plural. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. It's a spiritual thing. It was spiritually given to him. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this rock, of course, is what Peter had just confessed that he got from the Father, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the basis for the gospel of the kingdom. It says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's Abraham's bosom. He, the believers in Jesus Christ from after the cross never go to Abraham's bosom. They go to immediately to heaven when they die. There's no, there's no middle ground because they're redeemed. Redemption took place at that cross, Old Testament saints. That's why they came out. They had to come out. They were redeemed. Verse 19, And I will give unto thee, that's singular, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, thou shalt be loosed in heaven. So Peter was given the authority, and it says thou every time. Thee and thou. It's, he's, he's talking to Peter. He's not talking to the twelve. He's talking to that one man. And, he, and Jesus Christ gave him the authority that he was able to bind on earth, and he's, he was bound in heaven, and what he loose on earth, he'll be loosed in heaven. And he's, he's taking this authority that Jesus Christ gave to him right here, as he applies it to Acts 15, 11. He's, he, what he's doing here, he's loosening Israel from the gospel of the kingdom because Jesus Christ is not coming back. He's binding them to grace. He's telling them that they're saved by grace. All the way back to Acts 2, those Jews, they didn't know. All the way back to Acts 2, they're keeping the law. They're, doing, they're following Jesus Christ. He's the captain of their salvation. 
they're waiting for him to come back. And then what's going to happen to them, they're going to be given a new uh, covenant. They're going to be born again as a nation. Their sins are going to be taken and blotted out, taken away. They're going to be saved at that time. Peter's saying, no, no. He's not. He never mentions the Lord not coming back, but he tells them that they're saved by grace, right here in verse 11. We know that from Peter's epistles. When you get into Romans, you'll see that Israel set aside for a period of time until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled and all Israel shall be saved. There will be a fulfillment of the gospel of the kingdom, but this generation never fulfilled it. It just never happened to them. So they're saved by grace, just like the Gentiles that had believed on Jesus Christ. And that's it. It's, it's the beauty of the whole thing, how it all comes together here in Acts 15. And it was it's a relief to these uh, these Jews. It should have been. Now you read in Acts 21 that they're still zealous to keep the law. You're not going to change them, continue to keep the law. But the keeping the law has no uh, has nothing to do with their salvation. Nothing at all to do with it. Let's go down. I'm going to read on down through here, and then I'm going to discuss some other things. There's a lot of stuff here I'm going to get into. We'll cover we'll cover down to about verse 21. It says, but verse 12 says, Then all the multitude kept silence, gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. Well, they got up and spoke then, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And then after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Now this is either James the Lord's brother or James is the son of Alphaeus. Most people think it's the Lord's brother. Which is, could be. I don't think it matters. He's either an apostle or it was his brother. He goes, As Simeon, that's Peter, hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. He's talking about Cornelius back in Acts 10. And to this agree the words of the prophet, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth all these things. Known unto God are all the works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sense is that we trouble not them which uh, uh, from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Now, he goes and say, goes on and says, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses, why? Why are they to do these things? For Moses of old time, since way back, hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. In other words, there's Jews all throughout mixed in with the Gentiles in the cities of the Gentiles. And they have synagogues. And he doesn't want these Gentiles to be uh, have pollutions of idols, fornication, things strangled from blood, drinking blood, partaking in blood. Those are abominations to a Jew. In other words, it's for their testimony. It's for the testimony of these Gentiles before the, the Jews. Now, when you get into the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, you'll see a lot of this stuff about the animals that are sacrificed and some, he said, Paul says, hey, you can eat them if you want to, but you got to be careful who you're in front of when you eat them. And you don't want to be in front of a Jew when you're doing that, a Jewish believer when you're doing that. Because it's their testimonies involved. Now, what he's quoting here about the residue of men, uh, I'm going to read a couple verses, uh, Isaiah 50, 54, 1 to 5. What he's talking here about is Gentiles that are going to believe and go into the kingdom. Now, they still don't have a clear understanding of the, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles in, in the body of Christ. I don't even know if they know at this time whether uh, they're still looking at the Lord's coming back because they're talking kingdom stuff. He's, James is talking kingdom stuff yet yeah, right here. Uh, we'll read Isaiah 54, 1 to 5. You notice I refer to Isaiah a lot. Isaiah, is a, if you have never read it, you need to read the book of Isaiah. Read through Jeremiah. All these prophecies in there are unbelievable. It says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate 
than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now, there might be a little bit of a hidden picture there of the uh, Gentile, the body of Christ, which is primarily Gentile, because that children of the married wife is Israel. Israel, although she's unfaithful. But the, what does it say? That's this not travail. They didn't travail in the early book of Acts. They didn't fulfill the uh, what what they they could have done. And then it says there, for for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. Now the desolate would be the Gentile. It says, enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cord, and stretch thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Now that's the kingdom age, when those Gentiles uh, enter into it. Uh, I'm going to read you Amos 9, 11, and 12. It's right after Joel there. Amos 9, 11, and 12. So then that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David. That's what he referred to back there in Acts 15. That is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom, those are Gentiles, and all the heathen, those are Gentiles, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Those are Gentile believers. Those are the ones that are going into the kingdom. Now that's what he's talking about here. So what James is saying, he says that, hey, the Old Testament refers to Gentiles being saved. And then he quotes these quotations of basically from what I just read you. And there are many other places in the Old Testament where Gentiles are saved when they enter into the kingdom. That's all they know yet. Paul hasn't revealed to them the mystery of the body of Christ in Ephesians. Ephesians, he was in prison when he wrote that. And there's a lot of things that haven't been revealed. Romans, he starts revealing some of that stuff in the book of Romans. It hasn't been written, uh, written yet. So they don't have a clear understanding yet of what all is taking place. The thing is, there are Gentiles being saved, and they're going back to the Old Testament. At least they're saying, okay, that the Bible shows you that there will be Gentiles that will be saved. But those references are all to the uh, Gentiles in the kingdom. Turn to Romans. I want to show you something in Romans. They were never heard anybody teach this exactly you know, what I think is right. But if you if you read the book of Romans, the greatest book in the Bible on the doctrines of salvation, possibly the greatest book in the Bible, period, at least for the New Testament, for us. And it's written by the Apostle Paul to the Romans. Let's read uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Notice, Jew first, also the Greek. The Jew first. The Jews got the gospel of the kingdom, which is the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ has two gospels. One is the gospel of the kingdom given to Israel, that he's the Christ, the Son of God. They're to believe on him, they're to remain faithful to him, waiting for his return. That was given to them. That's what was presented to them. The Jew first. The Greeks were preached the gospel of grace, started preaching the gospel of grace to them. Now in Acts 15, that's when Peter looses them from the gospel of the kingdom, binds them to grace, where the Jew and the Gentile are all saved the same way. Now look at verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. There's two different faiths. Two different gospels. And they both had, the Jews had faith in the gospel that was given to them. And they were faithful to that. The Gentiles started believing the gospel that was given to them starting in Acts 13. And they were faithful to believe that. And there were Jews that believed it too. You start seeing the, where the Jews and the Gentiles believe it in one body. But first, that was given to the, uh, the Jews. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Both groups had faith to believe what they were told, the gospel they were given, which was the gospel of Christ. They were both the gospel of Christ. The Jews had the faith to believe the gospel of the kingdom. And then later on, Paul's gospel replaces it, Acts 15, 11. That's when Peter loosed them from that gospel of the kingdom 
binds them to grace. Prior to that, they were, there were two Gospels. At one time, in, in Acts 13 and 14, you've got two Gospels being, you've got two Gospels being preached. And what happens? They're, they're, they're banging heads together. Those Jewish believers are saying, hey, you Gentiles got to be circumcised and keep the law to be saved. And Paul says, oh no, 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 we're saved, they're saved by grace. And it finally it comes down to 1511, where the Peter, the, he's the head of the 12 apostles, to Israel, looses them from the gospel of the kingdom and bind them to the gospel of grace. To grace, they're saved by grace from that point on. Uh, now this, uh, I'm going to show you something interesting. Paul's conversion, let's go to uh, Galatians. Go to Galatians. Timing when to, when to show you this. It's kind of neat. Galatians, you look, look at Galatians, you'll see. Paul in Galatians, if you read Galatians, I'd put Romans first and Galatians. Probably for a new believer, Galatians possibly could be read first before Romans. But Paul here is... When he starts out in Galatians, he teaches that he he was given a gospel that wasn't given from the twelve. It was given from Jesus Christ. Uh, and he goes and put down to verse 9 and said, I say before the same now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which uh, ye have received, let him be accursed. In other words, Paul's gospel of grace is the only gospel that can be preached. He says, For do I now persuade men of God, or do I seek to please men? For if yet please men, I should not be a servant of God. And he says in verse 11, But I certify unto you, brother, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Like I mentioned in uh, Acts 26, the Lord said he was going to appear to him. When he appeared to him, he gave him that gospel. And he goes on and talks about his life as a Jew. And then in verse 15, when it pleased God, he separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. That's when Paul met the Lord on the road to Damascus. And he turned from Judaism, the believer in Jesus Christ, to reveal his son in me. Verse 16, I might preach among the heathen immediately. I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem them that were apostles before me, but went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. So that's the first time he went to, to Jerusalem. Now you drop down to chapter 2, verse 1. says, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now that's 17 years. That's 17 years later when Acts 15 occurs. After Paul's conversion. Now I'm going to show you something interesting. If we go back to Luke. Remember Luke 13 when I talked to you about Acts 7, the uh, parable given to Israel about the four years, the vineyard. Israel was given four years, and at the end of that four years, what did they do in Acts 7? They rejected Jesus Christ, blasphemed the Holy Ghost, and they scattered the Jewish believers. So they burned their four years, and they, Israel, that's when the 70th week of Daniel come, came to a halt. They were 190 days into it. I'm eventually going to show you the whole timeline, how the numbers all fit. Now let's drop down now, and let's go to verse 10. This is very interesting. It said, And he was teaching in one of the synagogues, speaking of Jesus, on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. Now there's a reason God gives you the, the number. And all these, when he gives you a parable or a story, there's a reason for it. He's teaching you something. 18 years, and was bowed together, and no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. You notice he used the word loosed. He didn't say healed. Loosed. Just like Peter loosed Israel from the gospel of the kingdom and saved them by the grace of God. That infirmity, that burden that Israel had of keeping the law, waiting for the Lord to come back. Eighteen years. I believe that Paul was converted a year after Pentecost. And then there's 17 years from Paul's conversion to Acts 15. And that would make the 18 years. In other words, Acts 7 is about six years after, or six months after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then you got about a period of be less than six months after that that Paul was converted. But, you know, because Pentecost is 50 days after the resurrection. It was the 50th day after the resurrection. 
So it was about four and a half months later, Act 7 takes place. So about another seven and a half months later, I think that's when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. So that's the 18 years. And that woman being healed is a picture of the Jews being healed because they're loosed from the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus Christ is going to come back 2,000 years later. He's not going to come back to this generation. He's not going to leave them hanging. Now what some people teach is, and I'm going to get into some things here that are a little bit deep maybe, but there's people teach that these people here are, the, are the, what's called the little flock. And they say that uh, these Jews continued to preach the gospel of the kingdom uh, until they died. They believed the gospel of the kingdom and they taught the gospel of the kingdom. And they teach that they died, they, then they go to Abraham's bosom, and then when Jesus Christ comes back, they're resurrected. Now there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, when first, for one thing, when you go to uh, the book of Galatians, and you're going to give an account, Paul's going to give an account of this, uh, we were just reading from Galatians here. When he talks about Galatians chapter 2, about Acts 15, when he came to Jerusalem, and he took Titus with him. You read down through here, verse 3. And he communicated to them about uh, preaching to the Gentiles. And he's rehearsing the things that took place in Acts 15. And he goes, if he dropped down to uh, verse uh, 7 of chapter 2 of Galatians, but contrary rise when they saw that the gospel was of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty to me toward the Gentiles. Peter was the top dog when it came to the ministering to the circumcision, as Paul was to the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Now they're saying here, that these people that teach this, they say, okay, they're going to the circumcision, they're continuing to preach the gospel of the kingdom. The problem with that is, if you read Galatians chapter 1, Galatians was written after Acts 15, after they had come to agreement. And he says that he couldn't preach any other gospel than that which was committed unto Paul. He said even an angel. Uh, the reason he says that, because... There were some people that were trying to, to uh, bring those Galatians back in under the law. And it was as part of their salvation. And uh, verse 6, it says uh, in, in chapter 1, it said, I marvel that you were soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another. Well, it's not another. It was the gospel of the kingdom. It already existed. It, it, it existed before the gospel of grace. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That is a perversion of it, because once it's settled in Acts 15, you can't preach another gospel. There only could be one. There can't be two being preached. They're, they're contrary to each other. Though we, or an angel from heaven, now that would include Peter and the boys, the eleven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And I say before, as I say, as I say, I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Paul's gospel is the only one to be preached. He's writing to the Galatians here. Now, as you go down here about Peter and all of them here, it says, look what it says. It says, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace that was given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. They're in agreement. They're in agreement about what salvation is. It's by grace. That's Acts 15. You've got to read Acts, 11, Acts 15, 11 into this verse right here. That we should go to the heathen they to the circumcision. Why would they go back to the circumcision? Because they'd been preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They'd been looking for the Lord to return. He's not returning. He's got to go back and tell these ones that are saved that, they're, hey, you're saved by grace. Jesus Christ isn't coming back. Your salvation's already uh, set for you. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Now let's start reading here. The reason you know this. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Now this is 
Paul getting on Peter. For before the certain came from James, now we don't know what James that is. Was that James the Lord's brother? Was that James the son of Alphaeus? Was that James, the, the, for those that follow James, uh, the uh, brother of John before he was killed in Acts 12? We don't know which James this is. It could have very well been James, the brother of John. He would have known nothing about the gospel of the grace because he was killed in Acts 12. It might have been some of his followers. He said, before that certain came from James, maybe they were followers. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Since that sounds a lot like what happened to uh, Peter when you know he went to, uh, after he saw Cornelius and how the Jews treated him after he had gone to see them. He weren't supposed to mess with them at time. And the other Jews assembled likewise with him, inasmuch as Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. And when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Now the word dissimulation means hypocrisy, by the way. It says that when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, there's only one gospel now. I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus had the faith to fulfill the law. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So he's pulling, he, he's, he, he's just putting it on Peter here. And he's talking about the gospel of grace here. Now if they're preaching two gospels, you know, he doesn't, he can't, he wouldn't come down on Peter like this. But definitely there's only one gospel at this time. It's obvious from these verses. Uh, he says in verse 17, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. You can't go back under the law. He says in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But yet I, not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life that I now live. In the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He's getting on Peter. And he's explaining about the gospel. I'll give him a little bit more understanding here. There's not two gospels from Acts 15. There's one. And that was the responsibility of those 11 apostles to go back to the circumcision and straighten them up on justification. They're justified, they're forgiven by God's grace. Now, I was going to mention that little flock. Turn to Luke 12, 32 to 41. And they say, okay, this little flock are the ones that uh, during the early Acts period, those Jews that believed, when they, they, they continued to believe what they believed until they died and they went to Abraham's bosom. Now Jesus said, he that endure the end shall be saved. Matthew 24. He's talking about the end of a period of time. Remember that's why I told you in Acts 7 that the time stopped. The 70th week stopped. And Jesus said, except those days be shortened, no flesh will be saved. Well, those days will continue after the church is taken out. And I'll show you when I get to the timeline. And they're shortened so that because no flesh could be saved. Unless, uh, no flesh is talking about people that are alive. He didn't in other words, Satan's goal is to destroy all flesh so that no one can go into the kingdom. That's his goal now. He can't do anything about the body of Christ. Now, he can try to mess us up. And that's why you got so much false doctrine being taught and all that. But uh, those days have to be short. And I'm going to read you the verse so I don't get it wrong. In verse 22 of Matthew 24, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Now he's talking here about people that are alive. He's not talking about resurrected people. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So what does that mean? 
Now the gospel of the kingdom, the reason God allowed it to go 18 years after Israel rejected in Acts 7 as a nation, the Jewish leaders. Let's go to Romans 10, verses 3 and 4. And brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Now, why is he concerned about Israel so much? Well, Paul was there in Acts 7 when they stoned Stephen, when they were blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And he was in agreement with them. He felt responsible for the fall of Israel. He was part of it. For I bear them record that they have the seal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, there's your, keep the commandments, for righteousness to everyone that believes. Those Jews, you could, you could convert them under the gospel of the kingdom because it involved who Jesus Christ was, and they were still to keep the law. But when you started preaching the righteousness of Jesus Christ and fulfilling the law for them, and by faith they received him as their Savior, they resisted that. They didn't want to believe that. Now God gave them 18 years. By grace, he gave them 18 years for them to believe the gospel of the kingdom. They would convert. Many of them converted under that. But boy, when Paul started preaching grace, salvation by grace, he started uh, meeting resistance. Resistance. That's something that I wanted to mention today. Uh, now I want to go back to that this thing about the uh, the little flock. Were they the little flock, little flock, the believers back there in the early book of Acts, under the gospel of the kingdom? Well, let's see what the what the Bible says about it. Look at verse thirty-one of chapter uh, twelve of Luke. It says, "But rather," he's talking to the Jews, "Seek ye the kingdom of God." That's a spiritual kingdom. And all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, that involved having faith, a spiritual thing. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have, and give alms, provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. And they did that in Acts 2, verse 45, and in Acts 4, verse 34. They sold their possessions. They were doing those things. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves liken to men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down and meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are they, those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken through. Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. <clears throat> Verse 41. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? Who, who is this parable about? The Lord never answers it. Never answers it. You can continue to read this chapter and he never answers it. Never answers it. Now, to, just like in uh, Acts chapter 1, remember when they said, I'm going to read you verse 6. It says, When they were therefore come together, the apostles, 11 of them, well, they asked of him, of Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. He said, But ye shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost come upon you, you shall be witness of me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, they never got any farther than uh, Judea and Samaria. Matter of fact, in the uh, Galatians there, they're going back to the Jews. The gospel of the kingdom is over for that generation. The gospel of the kingdom, Peter asked, is this parable about them when he's referring to the little flock? He didn't even answer it. The reason he didn't, because he wanted Peter to make sure that he did what he instructed him to do. He wasn't going to tell him, no, it's not going to be you. 
you're not Israel's not going to receive this gospel. The kingdom's not going to come because that little flock of believers that are going to come into the kingdom as human beings, not resurrected people. All those Jews that believed in that from Acts 2 to Acts 15, they died 2,000 years ago or a little bit less than that. And they were buried. And they're, they'll be resurrected someday. They're part of the body of Christ. When Jesus Christ comes, they'll be resurrected at the, at the rapture. Resurrected people don't have children. I'm going to give you some verses. Luke 20, verses 34 to 36. Now Jesus here is explaining the resurrection because there's these seven brothers. And the first one took a wife and died without children. And the second one, and he was responsible to, to bring seed for his brother. Well, he failed. The third one likewise fell and went through the seven. None of them had any children. Last of all, the woman died. And they asked Jesus, said, Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels and are children of God being the children of the resurrection. So they can't reproduce. So, re resurrected people are not the ones that are to go into the kingdom and populate the world. Now there will be resurrected people involved with the kingdom. We know that Paul mentioned, he said, if you suffer with him, you'll reign with him. And uh, you read in Revelation when the uh, tribulation saints are resurrected, the Bible says that they will reign in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And it mentions uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob communicating with Gentiles in the kingdom. He says that the children of the kingdom, the Jews of that time that didn't believe, they won't be, be involved with it. They'll be cast into hell. So the Old Testament saints, the body of Christ, the uh, uh, resurrected saints of the tribulation will all be involved with the kingdom, but they're not going to populate it. They're not the ones that are going to bring forth children. Isaiah 59, uh, 21-22. I'm going to read you some more. This, As for me, this is my covenant with them, said the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth forevermore. In other words, they're going to have seed. They're going to have offspring. Ezekiel 36, 38. And these are the, the, the new covenants I mentioned, verses that have to do with this, this uh, new covenant. Let's look at verse 37. Now, now, as you read down through Ezekiel chapter 36, you'll find that new covenant mentioned down through here. You have the set, second advent. Remember, I read this to you earlier about sprinkling clean water upon him, verse 25. From their filthiness, a new heart will I give them, a new spirit will I put in them, and I will take away a stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh, put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in the statutes. And in verse 29 says, I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon it. In other words, you're in the kingdom now. It goes on and gives you, shows you the blessings of the kingdom. You go down to verse 37, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like flock. They're going to have children. As the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem in her solemn feast, so shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men. And they shall know that I am the Lord. They're going to scroll. Boom. Population is going to just go crazy. And they're going to have offspring. Zechariah 9.16 It says, And the Lord their God shall save them in the day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up. It's like a jewel, you know, like diamonds. Lifted up as an ensign upon his land. So that's your flock. And they go into the kingdom as live people. They're not resurrected people because they have offspring. The little flock can't be people that have been resurrected. It's just not possible. So only resurrected people can go into that kingdom. Now I'm going to show you a few verses real quick and we'll kind of end this study on the uh, 
these, what I want to show you is that these Jews that from Acts 2 on that were converted under the gospel of the kingdom and confirmed to be saved by grace in Acts 15, 11 by the apostle to the Jews, Peter, who was able to loose and bind. Jesus Christ gave him the authority to do only he. Paul couldn't have done that. Now let's turn to Romans. This is the last few verses here. Well, I've got some. Better use this Bible. Romans 16, 7. And I'll show you one that proves it without a shadow of a doubt. I never hear anybody mention this one. But this is the end of the letter of Paul to the Romans. He says, Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, they're Jews, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. Notice the plural here. The twelve, the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now the dispensations say, yeah, they were in Christ, just like Jesus said that, that he was in God and they'll be in him. And they won't deny that. You see what's dishonest about this is Paul's not going to say that somebody's in Christ before him if they're not in Christ the same way that he was. Now Paul was never saved under the gospel of grace. He was saved under the gospel of the kingdom. But like I mentioned back there when Paul's conversion in Acts 9. What did he preach? He preached that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He wasn't preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. It hadn't been revealed to him yet. Even in Acts 13, it's not real clear. It's the sure mercies of David. He's starting to preach salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. But what I want you to uh, look at is fellow prisoners. Fellow prisoners. Uh, we know from this, from this scripture that Paul wasn't in, he wasn't in the prison to Rome at this time. Paul was out running around. You read about it over here in Acts 15. He goes to Jerusalem, verse 25. It goes on and says they took up a collection for him. You read all down through Acts 15, you'll see where he's traveling. He has intentions of going to uh, Spain. Whether he makes it or not, I don't know, but he's a free man right now when he, when he writes this book to the Romans. He's out traveling around. He's not a prisoner. He wrote Romans, he wrote Galatians, he wrote First and Second Corinthians, First and Second Thessalonians before he was ever in prison. So this being a prisoner here is not a reference to being the fact that he's a, a prisoner of Rome. He's a prisoner of Christ. Now, there's a lot of cross references to this. Uh, I'll give you a few here. Uh, Let's turn to Philemon, of all places. I'll show you some more. You know, when he speaks of being a prisoner of Christ, that's not the same as being in bonds to Rome. That's a different, that's a different thing. In Philemon, he says in verse 1, he says, A prisoner of Jesus Christ. And Timothy, our brother, and to Philemon, our dearly beloved. And you drop down to... Uh, Verse 21 says, Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say, but withal prepare me also a lodging. Now he's, he's, he's in a jail, he's in prison to Rome. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There, where Philemon's at, salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. He's not a prisoner. He refers to him as a fellow prisoner. Fellow prisoner. Uh, I've got a bunch more. Second Timothy 1 a. Colossians 4.10. Let's see. Now, Second Timothy. Let's see. 1 a. Let's see what that one is. It says, look at read, read it says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of the prisoner of who? The Lord here. He's not referring to himself being a prisoner of Rome. Colossians 4.10. It's all through the uh, Paul's epistles when he makes reference to being a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Colossians 4.10. He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, now, you read about this Aristarchus. There were two people named that. Now, one of them 
it talks about in Acts 19, 29, and Acts 20, verse 4, and I'm not going to go there, but he's a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. There's also a guy with the same name. When Paul was on a, 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 he was a prisoner on the ship headed for Rome, and he was mentioned there. Yes, this is another guy with the same name in, in Acts 27, 2. But this Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, he ministered with Paul in the book of Acts. And he's called a fellow prisoner. He was never a prisoner of Rome. He was in jail for anything. And you got to go to the book of Ephesians, 3.1 and 4.1. 3.1 says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. And another, it says, I therefore, in verse 4, chapter 1, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. Now, this is a reference to him we know that when he wrote Ephesians, it was a prisoner epistle. He was in prison, but he's talking about being a prison, prisoner of Jesus Christ. This, this uh, bonds of Jesus Christ. Uh, now let's go, I'll tell you, show you how you explain this. Second Timothy 2.13. What does he mean by being a prisoner of Jesus Christ? It's a doctrinal thing. If you're saved, you're a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You're locked into them. 2 Timothy 2.13. I'm going to read you some. And I'm going to end this study today with this verse. Just think about it. Paul speaking in start verse 10 says, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. It's conditional that you reign if you suffer. If we deny him, you also deny us. What? You won't reign with him. You'll be in New Jerusalem, but you're not participating with the kingdom. Saints. If we believe not, that's someone who's trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Maybe they lost their mind. Who knows what happened to them? They can deny the Lord or whatever. But if they're truly saved, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You're a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You're saved. That's what Paul's talking about. Now back here in Romans 16 when he talks about his kin kinsmen and fellow prisoners, those are Jewish believers. And he's, and there's a lot more places where in Galatians it talks about uh, people that were in Christ before him. Paul was an honest person. If he, when he mentions somebody being in Christ, they're in Christ the same way that he is. They're in the body of Christ. They're a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He would have to deny himself to deny them. That's our, that's our security that we have in Christ and our salvation. So I'm going to stop there with the, with the book of Acts. Uh, hopefully I've covered everything I intended to. But you can see in Acts 11 the importance of that. For we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we Jews shall be saved even as they, the Gentiles. It goes all the way back to Acts 2. They're saved by grace. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're in the body of Christ. It starts in Acts 2. Nobody knows about it until Paul reveals it in his epistles. So we'll stop there.